Our exhortation this morning will be provided by Brother Rob Scott. His subject is the perspectives on helping and in preparation for his remarks, he's asked that we read from Luke 21, the first four verses. So Luke 21, verses 1 through 4. And he looked up and saw the rich men casting their gifts into the treasury. And he saw also a certain poor widow casting in thither two mites. And he said, Of a truth I say unto you, that this poor widow have cast in more than they all. For all these have of their abundance cast in into the offerings of God, but she of her penury hath cast in all the living that she had. So with that reading, let's turn our attention to Brother Rob on the topic, Perspectives on Helping. Brother Rob. Good morning, everyone. I had to find someone to tell before I came up here not to misperceive my remarks because these are, I usually, I choose things that I think I need work at and, and hopefully as I prepare my words and my remarks, I learn something and, and I can share my deficiencies and hopefully maybe some of you share in the same deficiencies and we can all illuminate those, illuminate those deficiencies together and, and endeavor to um, make better. Um, you know, there's so many members of our meeting have undertaken a class upstairs with Brother Dustin um, on ways that we can help and give and help the poor. So it's meeting up here for Sunday school. Um, I, I haven't come up here to it, but I've, um, I think it's a wonderful thing um, that we're doing something like that. I think this is um, what God intends for Ecclesias to do, is to grow um, practically in their service by encouraging one another, identifying things that we need help with, and working through those things together so we can collectively become better. Um, so I think it's a wonderful thing. Um, and again, this is what God intends for us to do. Um, you know, we, uh, we were talking in the car today how wonderful it is that we have a spiritual family here, that we have a place where we're all um, a family that has the same purpose. Um, and, and that's something that not everyone has. And, and we missed last week with our family. We, do, we have a family tradition we do every year. And we missed last week. And our kids actually said, you know, we don't want to ever miss the chapel. And that was something that was really powerful to me because, you know, that means that things are going well for our kids, you know, and, and that's what we have Sunday school for. And, you know, if we have our kids telling us we never want to miss the chapel, what a blessing that is from God. Because if I'm floundering in my faith and my, um, in my resolve that my kids are saying we, we don't want to ever miss the chapel, then man, what a merciful blessing that is to have. Um, so my remarks today, I want to briefly explore the challenges associated with effectively helping. Um, it's very difficult to know how to effectively help. And I will preface my remarks again by saying, I don't have all the answers. Um, that's why there's a book called when helping hurts. And that's why there's so many books and perspectives on how to effectively help because it's not. Um, something really easy. That's why there's a six-week class, and I'm sure when it's done, they won't have all the answers still, but it, it's something um, that I think the main point is we have to endeavor to do, and we have to understand that there's mercy for how poorly we execute God's will, um, because we're never going to execute anything per uh, perfectly. Um, so these are challenges that I want to discuss that that we use sometimes as excuses not to help and inhibitions to helping that can sometimes get us off course when our purpose is to do good. Um, so the questions I want to address are, what are our challenges in helping and giving? How can we be ineffective in helping? Like when is it we're not doing a good job even though our intention is to help? Um, and in what ways and in what, pe what ways and what people did Jesus help? And then finally, who deserves our help? And do we deserve help? So 
I think if we can reconcile that point, then, then it'll give us some good perspective on, um, on help. So what are some of the challenges that come to mind? And again, this is just me being honest. So this is me speaking, maybe I'll share in some of these or not, but um, the first help, if we're overly helpful to people, do we, do we sometimes say, well, you know, we could be enabling that person, you know? So, so what if we're creating a dependency that's not helping them to progress because we're enabling someone by offering them too much help or, or the wrong type of help? Um, what if we create a dependency so that they're not moving forward, they more dependent on us so that they can sustain instead of moving forward for, their, for themselves. So that, that's, that's something that we might either use as an excuse not to be helpful, that we say, look, I, I don't wanna go down that road. God knows of whether it's truly an excuse or truly a reason that we find as a sincere reason. Um, another, another element of, of helping is sometimes it can kind of involve this commitment that doesn't have defined parameters. So like you feel like you're opening up a can of worms, like, oh man, I'm on the hook now. I started helping. They're gonna expect me to help every week now. You know, so, so sometimes we feel like we don't wanna to endeavor to do those things because it, it might compel us to continue to help. Um, I don't have time right now. You know, I've got four kids. Boston's have eight kids. <laughs> Some of us work two jobs. You know, there's a lot of us out here that can say we honestly don't have time. So is that valid or is it not valid? And what other ways can we help? Um, so this, this leads us to the questions of how do we prioritize our time? So some statements like my family needs me right now, or if I don't work, I can't help anyone. Th those are things we might say um, to ourselves to, to kind of discuss why we wouldn't help. So these are valid statements in many instances, but they also provide us an out at times too, don't they? So um, another problem is there's different degrees and ways of helping. So I have plenty of money to help. It's something we might find ourselves saying, you know, I've, I've got money to help, so I'm gonna help, which is a great thing. Um, but it's not surprising that we tend to elevate each other based on the age old standards of society. Therefore, the more money you're helping with equals the more helpful you are. So I, th I think we can easily correlate that into elevating how much people are helping by putting a dollar amount on, on that. Um, our human minds are prone to this type of quantifying so much that we often find time, find ways to let each other know the degree to which we are helping so we can get this perceived credit for helping. Um, so think of the term philanthropist. So. My definition of a philanthropist is someone you know has a ton of money because they've donated a ton of money. So that's what a philanthropist is. So, <laughs> so it, it, there's, there's almost like a self-servingness in the, if, if you've been coined a philanthropist, then yeah, that's a great thing, but everyone also knows how much you've given and how much you have to give. So, so there's, it, it's, it's a complicated thing how we give and, and what attitudes we have um, with regard to, to giving. Um, it's not easy to do. Then we think about how much money, we, we think about money and then we think, how much money should I give? How much is enough to give? So the account of the widow's might that was just read for us, that one makes me uncomfortable. I don't, is, does anyone in this room not feel uncomfortable when they read that account of the widow's might <laughs> that this lady gave up the last $2? <laughs> we'll, we'll call them dollars. The last two dollars that she had to her name. When, if I had two dollars, I'd be like, I need two dollars more and then two more. <laughs> so it's, it's a very, um, it, I mean, you can correlate it to um, how much we're supposed to sacrifice of ourselves and how much we're supposed to give of ourselves in, in terms of this whole sacrifice that God wants from us. All of us is to be sacrificed, but when you put it in monetary terms, especially like this example, it's really kind of scary. Um, so it makes you kind of think to the question, like, all right, so how much money do I really need to have in savings? Or should saving money for my kid's college be more important than helping someone in need? I don't have the answers. I won't answer for you what my thoughts are. But these are the questions we have to ask ourselves because these are the questions that we know there are people out there that need help. 
So we have to find the right balance to helping in an appropriate way, you know? So um, if I give my money away, will God still continue to provide? Like, do, do I put myself in a compromised position financially by helping others? Am I putting God to the test? Will God still provide for me if I, if I give away too much of what I have? So those are things that I wrestle with. Hopefully some, some of you all are beyond that kind of thinking, but I know I'm not because those are difficult things to ask. But the main question it really comes down to is, do I have the faith to truly sacrifice something of value to me? And that comes down to time or money. You know, what is the most valuable thing to me? Well, I'd say time right now. You know, I, we, none of, I don't think any of us would agree that there's enough time in the day to do everything we want to do. So to me, it's time. Um, of course, money is a close second or maybe even tied. <laughs> so um, these, are, these are scary, make you squirm kind of questions. You know, these are questions that we, when we ask ourselves, we, it makes us feel inefficient because when I ask myself these things, I'm like, I, I don't have that in me right now. You know, I don't have that level of faith right now to, to do those things. So we walk an incredibly fine line of being good stewards of what God has given us and justifying why it's not appropriate to give of our time or resources right now, don't we? Um, I say we because my mind, again, is uh, on its own, will continually justify my reasons for not seeking after a faithful spiritual approach to, to how I do things. So again, I don't have the 30-minute exhortation answers to these questions. Um, that's why they have books written and long discussions about these things. And we can talk about, you know, separately how we can um, do these things effectively. Um, part of the good news about this is that this is part of our spiritual growth as much as anything else is. You know, we're not going to be perfect givers. We're not going to be perfect at anything ever, but we have to have the faith to try. And, and so like other endeavors we take, rarely are our intentions purely selfish or purely spiritual, but instead a combination of the two. You know, we're, it's hard to be 100% pure, but because we're not 100% pure doesn't mean we're 100% evil and out for ourselves. It's part of our spiritual growth of, of how we, start practicing in giving of ourselves. Um, thankfully, we have grace and forgiveness for when we fail, so long as we can see our weaknesses. We have the direct intervention of Jesus in our lives. Just as he helped with the first century ecclesia through the pangs of spiritual growth, he's with us also. Like so many other things, we must rely on intervention from God and his son to execute our efforts in a way that reflects glory. This isn't something we're able to do on our own. N nothing that comes from Rob is going to be full of glory. It, it, it involves the, the intervention of Jesus and, and, and the things of God to, to mesh with what I'm trying to bring so that there is ultimately glory and what we do, that it brings glory to God. But like so many other things, getting out of the way and truly allowing ourselves to be a vessel is what we all suffer with, I think, is we, we insert ourselves and our own carnal thinking into things, and um, we, we pollute what would otherwise, you know, be a beautiful thing. Um, so... One example of what I would call giving gone wrong is an account we all know. It's from um, Acts chapter 5, uh, verses 1 through 10. I'll read that account. Again, I think it's one we're all familiar with. So Acts chapter 5, verses 1 through 10. It reads, but a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession, and he kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? 
and after it sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart, and why you have not lied to men, but to God? Then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. So great fear came upon all those who heard these things, and the young men arose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. Now it was about three hours later when his wife came in, not knowing what had happened, and Peter answered her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. She said, yes, for so much. Then Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Then immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. And the young men came in and found her dead, and carrying her out, buried her by her husband. So great fear came upon all the church and upon all who heard these things. It's like a scary movie or something, isn't it? I mean, it's it's a pretty alarming um, in, event that happens. Um, so I've always kind of been able to see the error of the ways of these seemingly spiritual people. But you know, if we we think about it on a topical level, it's like I mean, they're still giving some money. I mean, they're, they're still not completely wrong, are they? So. The couple in Acts was, I think the reason was they were trying to gain credit and glory among their brothers and sisters while preserving their own financial interests. And so the conclusion is there's no room for our selfish interests when it comes to serving our Lord. The timing and the development of the first century ecclesia made, important, made it very important that these motives not be tolerated. They had a long road to go. They had a lot of shared struggles that they were going to have together, and, and these motives could not be tolerated. And so this was a pretty public event of them, you know, being uh, directly and immediately punished for their actions. But I think the most important part that we don't realize that we, I think we do well to remember is that God and Jesus alone know the intentions of our hearts. And, and these brethren had the gift of the Holy Spirit with them, and they knew the intentions of their hearts because of this. So I, I think that's the most important part about this is this wasn't some speculation that they cast on them like, oh, I see what you're doing there, and, and they condemned them to death. This was something that they knew um, through the power of the Holy Spirit that this is the mind that they had. Um, so when we address ourselves or, or others, we must we should never assume insincerity on the part of others. That's just not our job to to assume people are insincere. Um, instead, we must endeavor to be sincere ourselves. Um, so Jennifer and I um, have been listening to a um, podcast. How long have podcasts been around? I just like discovered them last week. But <laughs> we've been listening to a podcast by uh, Brother Nathan Lewis from New Zealand, um, and it's called The Mind of Christ. Look it up. It's pretty, it's very good. Um, I see some nods out there. Um, and he has a great accent, too. He, he says the word death like D. Yeah. Our carnal mind leads to D. So <laughs> if nothing else, you, you enjoy that part. Um, <laughs> but after listening to his first class, Jennifer and I were, were both, um, very aware of our human condition, and, and this is the human condition that we inherited um, in the Garden of Eden. Um, and so his intent was to first identify the problem so he could reveal the beautiful solution. So um, he, he went into great detail that our mind in showing how our minds are prone to self-gratifying thoughts and motives and how truly hopeless we are when it comes to overcoming these things. There's no training that our mind, that, that we can give our mind that overcomes this nature. No training. Instead, we must truly put on the mind of Christ. Jesus is the answer. Is he is the one who ultimately put on the mind of his Father in all things and yet shared in our nature. There's great power um, in the account of the epileptic um, who continually gets cast into the fire and the water. It's from uh, Mark 9, verses 20 through 27. Mark 9, 20 through 27. 
It says, Then they brought him to him, and when he saw him, immediately the spirit convulsed him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming at the mouth. So he asked the father, How long has this been happening to him? And he said, From childhood. And often he's thrown him into both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, If you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out with, and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit and said, deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. Then the spirit cried out, convulsing him greatly and came out of him, and he became as one dead. So many said, he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up and he arose. So the most powerful part of that account is help me in my unbelief. I mean, how often do we need that prayer? I mean, we, we, we know the gospel message. We have what we feel like a, a good understanding of God's plan, but it's not about understanding a doctrine that makes us believers or not believers. It's whether we believe and have faith in what God does for us and, and his son Jesus and his intervention in our life. So he says, help me in my unbelief. So I think we can apply this same appeal to helping others when we ask Jesus, Lord, help me in my insincerity. Help me with my selfish motives. Help me to be humble. Help my faith that I may give more of myself and more of what I have to give. I think, I think a lot of us feel like we have to fix these things before we go to Jesus and go to God with them, that we have to Man, I don't, I don't, my faith is really weak right now. I, it's really not a good time for me to go to Jesus because my faith is in such a bad place. But I think we've, we've got that wrong if that's our attitude because that's especially when we need to come to Jesus. It's when we're in weakness. So we have to ask ourselves, what is the ultimate intent of helping others? We must assure ourselves that our motives are to bring the good news to those we help. When we help our brothers and sisters, is it, it is so we may be glorified together at the return of Jesus. So when we help each other, we've all identified each other as brothers and sisters. And our goal as a, an ecclesia is to bring with us as many people as we can to that kingdom age that has been promised. When we help those outside of the faith, it is to bring that gospel message of hope and redemption. Redemption from the hopeless life we live without God and his son. So these thoughts bring up two important questions that, that I'd like to ask. So one, do we, when, when it comes to helping and giving to others, do we rely too heavily on the verse that refers to, especially within the household of faith, when it comes to helping others? Is that a verse that we kind of run with? I refer to this frequently, but it's something I'm guilty of. Um, so I'll say it again, we have to leave our comfort zone. So let's think of a scenario and how it goes down. So brother and sister so-and-so has been going through a hard time financially, and we are undertaking an effort to help. So we're hopefully glad to help, so we simply put a check in the collection, anonymously put some cash in the collection, or give it directly to the person in need. I think we'll all agree that this is a very needed and appropriate way and situation. It's a, an appropriate situation that calls for help, and this is, you know, an appropriate way of helping. Now let's look at the, the alternative. You're in the community. An unbathed, loud, and mentally struggling person comes up and wants to discuss the Bible and probably also needs your help. I don't think any of us are so heartless as to say that this person need, doesn't need our help. But at the same time, we may, may be more likely to let someone else handle that one. I bring up these examples because I'm guilty of helping only when it involves the least path of resistance to me. So we can shop for helping. I think that's what we all naturally will do is shop for the easiest path of, of um, resistance. So the second question is, 
Do we sometimes use a complicated gospel message as our excuse not to embark on discussions with those whom we would help? So we meet the, the man described above, the, the second example, and we're able to offer him hope. Are we able to offer him hope? Or do we dismiss him as unable to comprehend the complexities of our message? Like, this guy's not going to understand my beliefs. Are you kidding me? Like, th that would be, this is going to be a very hard discussion. So I'm not even going to really go there right now. So downstairs in Brother David's class, um, in studying the letters, letters to Corinthians, a couple weeks ago, we, um, we reached a very refreshing conclusion in that how far the brethren had deviated from what we would consider very fundamental aspects of faith. You know, so the Corinthian Ecclesia was converted, their first century Ecclesia. They understood the gospel message, at least at one time. Um, but now they are not sure about the resurrection of the dead. They're, they're committing some very immoral acts. They're taking each other to court. There's some sexual immorality. So the Corinthian church is struggling, but he still refers to them as his brethren. So a, a lot of us here, and I've never been on one, but um, do mission trips to other countries. And so we, we look, so what gospel was shared on those mission trips? You know, how complicated was that gospel? And do we allow that there's room for growth when we learn the gospel message? Or do we have to understand a very long checklist of things before we're considered brethren? So do we allow for that growth? And do we... I don't think we, we're not in the business of tolerating false doctrine, but at the same time, do we complicate the gospel message so much that it would keep us from talking to someone about our wonderful hope? So is it, is it possible to make the gospel burden some news? So what does Paul say um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2? He says, and I, brethren, when I came to you, I did not, I did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God, for I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So clearly we don't have the Holy Spirit to... Um, share in this miraculous display as Paul was able to and Peter, but we can share the spirit of Christ that we rely on and, and use that to bring this simple gospel message to people because it's the simplicity of the gospel message is where the power of that message is found, I think. So complicating this simple message through human thinking and action will certainly inhibit the person, the the purpose of our helping, if we, if we overcomplicate this gospel message and, and what we think someone is capable of understanding or we define the gospel as more than this simple message at, at the beginning of our speaking to someone, I think it can complicate our willingness to help because we, we, we're pessimistic about whether or not someone would be able to understand it. I hope that makes sense. Um, and then again in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, um, Paul says, For though I am free of all men, I have made myself a servant to all that I might win the more. And to the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might win Jews. And to those who are under the law, as under the law, that I might win those that are under the law. To those who are without the law, as without the law, not being without law toward God, but under law toward Christ. That I might win those who are without law. To the weak I became as weak that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men that I might by all means save some. Now I do this for the gospel's sake that I may be a partaker of it with you. We must allow ourselves to serve others by meeting with them where they are and as they are. It takes more than just an open door. It, it takes action. As the Apostle Paul puts it, we must make ourselves servants and meet people where they are. So as we focus our attention to our Lord Jesus, let's talk about the ways that Jesus helped. 
if I describe what I think for me, and this is an attitude I've had in the past that I'm, I'm, I've recently overcome, hopefully, the flawed attitude or perspective that, um, that I've held was if there's a person that wants help, but I can identify the reason that they struggle as being a result of their own bad decisions or immorality, then I can justify myself by saying they don't really deserve help right now because look, it's their own fault what's going on with them. So you can't help someone who's got that going on, right? So that was a, a flawed perspective I held for a very long time. And that was something I used to justify not necessarily helping someone. So totally heartless sounding, isn't it? But that's, that's kind of the way I used to think about it. You, you know, you might hear yourself saying, well, obviously he's poor. He spends all of his money on fill in the blank. Um, he's a drug addict. Of course you can't help him. He's got to fix that first before we can help him. You know, so we, so we, doesn't it help make it so much easier for us not to help if we can identify reasons why people don't deserve our help? We like to put, we can, we can get in the habit of putting heavy parameters around helping. And when the perfect scenario arises that checks all the boxes, then we can help. Okay, so who did Jesus choose to help? Simply stated, he helped those who wanted and needed help. To paraphrase, those that are well do not need a physician. So how badly do we need Jesus' help? How much are we responsible for the things we constantly do that need repentance, forgiveness, and healing? Do we deserve the repeated help? that Jesus and God give us, and how many of the things that we need help for are a result of our terrible decisions and our carnal minds. So for us to withhold help from others because they suffer from the same thing that we do really doesn't make any sense at all. There'd be no such thing as the word grace if we deserved everything that we received. Jesus also forgave. Although we don't have the way, the power to forgive the way Jesus does, we must see past the flaws of people that we would help and know that none of us are ultimately worthy. If we have forgiven someone, we do not withhold from helping them, so we must always forgive those that trespass against us. How many times have we been helped by our Lord to see the error of our ways, been forgiven, but yet we continue to fail over and over? Thank you to God because he's provided his son to continually intervene in our lives and help us over and over when we fail through the same flawed thinking. So how does Jesus instruct us to help? In Matthew 6, he says, and we're all familiar with these verses as well, take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise you have no reward for your father in heaven. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, charitable deed do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets that they may have glory for men assuredly i say to you they have their reward but when you do a charitable deed do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing that your charitable deed may be in secret and your father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly this is not easy for us it's not that we don't want to be recognized for what we do necessarily, but it's also that we don't want people to think we do nothing. You know, I think that's just as big of a deterrent to, to making sure people know that you're being helpful. I don't want people to think I'm not doing anything. So I, I got to find a way to let them know I'm doing something right. Otherwise they're just going to think, well, Rob doesn't do anything for anybody. So, so that's our human nature. So whether it's, whether it's motivated by pride that we're proud of what we're doing, or if it's motivated by fear that we fear people will think we don't do anything. So this, these things are in God's word because they're real and they're, they're things that people suffer with, myself included, obviously. Therefore, I think it's equally important that we're very careful that we don't cast judgment through our speculation of how much we believe people give or don't give. So that's on us too, to help alleviate that fear that people might have that they're feared is doing nothing. We need to be sure that we're the ones who give them a break and we're not gonna try to um, 
we're not going to try and speculate on how much people give um, and, and to what extent they give. So what material things did Jesus have to offer? I don't think a lot. He had no money and he had nowhere to lay his head. So he couldn't go stay at Jesus' house and he didn't have any money to give you. So those are two things right off the bat that we would say in today's standards, that's not much help at all. <laughs> Can't give me any money and don't even have a house I can stay at. So th those are two things off the bat that, that Jesus didn't have. These are the first things that come to our mind when it comes to helping though. Is, well, the first thing I can probably do is give that person some money because they don't have any money. And, oh, they don't have a shelter. Let, let's give them a home or somewhere that they can stay out of the weather. But don't get me wrong. There's much to be said for helping in a material way first so that we may ultimately help spiritually. Uh, the, the, the touch and teach principle, you know, it's a very strong principle. We must always keep in mind, however, the greatest gift we can give someone is the gospel message. And how do we give that away? And I think that comes through availability. Our money doesn't teach the gospel. Um, our presence does. Um, our, our words teach the gospel. Our hands directly um, doing work in God's name is what teaches the gospel. Jesus often changed courses to be available and spent more time in abiding in certain areas than he may have planned originally. So that's that was the biggest resource Jesus gave of himself. Obviously, the miraculous things he did, but he gave his time to people. He spent time abiding in places that maybe he thought he was only going to spend a day, and his disciples would be like, where are we going? He'd say, well, we're going to go back over here for a while um, because he saw a need and he fed people by his presence. So I'll, I'll use the efforts that are going on with RVA Light for an example. Our brothers and sisters who spend time at RVA Light are available. The hope that they may show the grace of God as demonstrated by Jesus in meeting people where they are, as they are, and helping them. Then as a result, these people may see light and peace in these people that are working there and say, you know what, I don't believe, I don't know, and I do not have the strength to overcome but I see that you might know the answer. So please help me in my unbelief to believe because I've seen something in you. So what type of people did Jesus help? Lepers, harlots, centurions, Pharisees, Samaritans, Gentiles, and that's only to name a few. People are brought to us for a reason. Opportunities arise for a reason. And just like the gospel message that requires our response, we must respond when we have been afforded the opportunity to help instead of crossing the street to the other side. As we approach the memorial table, let us remember how little we deserve the immense help that God gives us in his son, Jesus Christ. How this grace given is exactly that, grace. It's unearned and undeserved. In closing, I'd like to read um, a passage I think really ties this well together. Um, again, spoken by the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians um, chapter 9, verses 6 through 15. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 through 15. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you may always have all sufficiency in all things, and you may have an abundance for every good work, as it is written, he has dispersed abroad, he has given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness while you are enriched in everything for all liberality, which causes thanksgiving through us to God. For the administration of this service not only supplies the needs of the saints, but also is abounding through many thanksgivings to God, while through the proof of this ministry, 
They glorify God for the obedience of your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your liberal sharing with them, for them and all men, and by their prayer for you, who long for you because of the exceeding grace of God in you. Thanks be to God for his undescribable gift. May we see the opportunity to help as truly a gift that we're willing to embrace and continue to give to others. Thank you so much.